Hello and welcome to the first lecture in our first unit of the course um, wherein I will introduce you to um, the ideas of literacy and discourse, two ideas and terms that will be very important to our work this semester. So the purpose of this lecture is to again introduce you to these terms. Um, these are fairly complex terms. I'm going to throw a lot of ideas at you. Um, so the idea is just to um, digest them and to work through them to better understand them as we progress in the unit. So first let's talk about what literacy is, a many-meaninged thing. The Oxford English Dictionary defines literacy as the ability to read a specific subject or medium. Or it also says literacy can mean a competence or knowledge in a certain area. To put this into my own words, I would say that literacy is generally a fluency in a practice. So of course, we're used to thinking of literacy as a fluency in the practice of reading or in the practice of writing. But as our video showed, um, the what is literacy in the 21st century video that we looked at um, the other day, literacy can also mean the ability to read all kinds of different texts, um, whether that's um, knowing how to work with a computer, so to read a computer, or whether that's understanding um, dance, um, not only uh, <clears throat> it, not only the terms and what they mean um, when you're in a dance lesson, let's say, but the specific muscle groups you're working, um, knowing the technique behind what you're doing. Um, if you're in medicine, knowing how to read a body, what different symptoms mean um, in terms of reaching a diagnosis. So really the idea of reading can be broadened um, and we can look at the ways in which we do a number of different things in this world. Um, James Paul G says, in fact, that um, literacy is about ways of being in the world, an idea that we'll come back to by the end of the lecture. So one of the major ideas I want to get across to you in this lecture is that literacy is a sociocultural practice, and that means that this that literacy is formed um, through social and cultural forces, and it looks different in different cultural it looks it looks different in different cultural groups. So when we're looking at different ethnic groups, age groups, sexes, socioeconomic classes. Literacy changes, those practices changes, um, because what we value in those different cultural groups changes, and um, we interact differently in those groups. Um, because our social interactions, um, the communities we're in, our backgrounds, our cultures, they're what form our literate practices. Um, and that's an idea we'll talk about a lot this semester. Um, but think about the people in your life, um, the ways in which you've done things based on where you were, who you were with, um, what was valued in that situation. That all has, um, th those all play factors in the formation of our literacies. So to give you an example, one surprising example is bedtime stories. Um, and so I'm going to try to quickly give you an idea of um, what an article by researcher Shirley Bryce Heath is all about. Um, she looked at literate practices um, in three different communities in North Carolina. Um, she looked at what she called Maine Town, Roadville, and Tracton. Those are all pseudonyms given to three different um, communities that were made up of different social classes, um, socioeconomic classes, different racial demographics. Um, Maine Town was a middle class, mostly white, community with white collar workers. Roadville was more blue collar, um, still mostly white, but um, a lot of mill workers working um, at the mill doing labor. Um, and then Tracton was a mostly African American community um, also doing labor um, and was significantly poorer than the other two that she looked at. So the basic idea um, here is that bedtime stories are something that many of us often take for granted as something that every child grows up with. But truly, bedtime stories are a socially and culturally situated practice. Um, it's not something that happened in all three of these communities in the same way, or even at all in Tracton. Um, in Tracton, they encouraged children to interact in, different, in other ways. Um, instead of reading them stories, they were integrated into adult conversations. Um, they told stories. They had other practices that stood in for bedtime stories. 
Um, and although bedtime stories were being read in Roadville, they were being read in different ways. Children were being asked different questions about the books they were being read. They were interacting with the books in a different way, and they were taught to value the books in a different way. Um, so the different values of these different communities, um, think of Main Town, for instance, um, being middle class and white collar. Most of the uh, parents in Main Town had jobs that required um, a college degree to get. So they really valued education because they saw it as leading to the, their way of life. So that community valued books and really impressed upon their children how important they were, whereas books were still given importance in the other two communities, but in a different way. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe I'm starting to confuse you at this point. Um, it's a very long article that goes into a lot of nuance. But basically, I want you to think of the fact that different cultures have different ways of taking, as Bryce puts it, from meaning from one's environment. So we have different ways of reading and interacting with that environment that are shaped by our values and our culture. What we're really talking about when we talk about expanding literacy beyond reading and writing is the idea of multiliteracies. And this is a term that came that arose when many scholars and researchers in writing studies, education, and linguistics felt that literacy was about more than just the ability to read and write. James Paul G. says that literacy is about not just the, you know, the ability to put together words, to spell, to, you know, learn grammar. It's not just about the language itself, but it's the meaning behind what we say that is really integral to an understanding of literacy. As well, I want you to think about the plural literacies in your lives, and hopefully the discussion board activity kind of helped you get at that idea. The fact that um, you are literate in a number of different practices. And sometimes you're literate in the same practice, but you go about it in different ways when you're within different discourse communities. So discourse community is a term that we'll be talking about this semester. Um, and one really basic way of understanding it is just a cultural group that has shared values and ways of doing things, shared literacies and shared texts. Um, so you may, for instance, at UC, be a part of the University of Cincinnati discourse community. Um, you're also part of um, the discourse community of universities, but you're also moving through several different discourse communities within the university. Um, perhaps you belong to um, a fraternity or sorority or um, a club sport or a social group. Perhaps you are taking biology classes and engineering classes and architecture classes and dance classes and music classes. Those are all different discourse communities. They have different ways of approaching the world. They have different ways of reading texts. They have different texts they're using um, and they have different values. So again, discourse community is an idea that we're going to get at in more detail at the end of this, towards the end of the semester. But I want you to be thinking now about the fact that you were involved in several discourse communities and that those discourse communities shape your literacies. Um, you may have also noticed that I've been throwing around the word text a lot in a way that could possibly be, possibly be confusing if you're thinking of a text as simply a document with printed words. Um, in writing studies, a text can also refer to any kind of artifact that can be studied. So um, a dance performance, um, a painting, um, food, you know, baked, uh, put together by a chef, um, a web page, a video. These can all be texts, um, some kind of object that we can study. So that's something to keep in mind as we continue as well. So the second part of the lecture, then, is closely related to literacy. Um, I want us to start thinking about discourse. So discourse is the systems of language used by communities and cultural groups, and sometimes we call these dialects. The textbook definition says that it's language in action. Um, and the second part of the definition on this PowerPoint slide is the one to focus on here. So again, on the previous slide, we said that discourse was a system of language, right? So um, the textbook definition here says a collection of instances that demonstrate a quality. Um, so legal discourse is, you know, mangled and dry and difficult to read. Um, there is something called legal discourse because 
we see writing that has certain patterns um, and we can say, okay, this is a system. This is some kind of recurring pattern. We're going to call this discourse. It's not just that 50 different lawyers happen to magically write the same way. This is um, a pattern. This is a system of language. And this is an idea we'll talk about when you read um, an essay by Amy Tan called Mother Tongue, in which she describes her many different Englishes. Um, so this kind of points back to the idea of dialects. Um, she has different Englishes that are formed by different parts of her life. She speaks a different kind of English with her mother than she speaks with other people who are not Chinese native speakers. Um, and some of you may have uh, multiple dialects in your backgrounds as well, perhaps um, you are familiar with African American vernaculars or Appalachian dialects or um, Chicana uh, languages. Um, these are all different discourses, different um, collections of language. So that is discourse with a lowercase d that we've been talking about. I'm going to further complicate this by talking about the idea of discourse with a capital D. And I'll use two men to do this. James Paul G, our friend from earlier in the PowerPoint, who talked about ways of being in the world as literacy. All right, and that's closely connected to this idea of discourse I'm going to talk about. And I'm also going to use an example of baseball with my good friend Chase Utley here. Um, so James Paul G says that discourses with a capital D, um, and that's important. He put a capital D on it because he's trying to give it a new definition. Discourses are ways of being in the world. They are forms of life which integrate words, acts, values, beliefs, attitudes, and social identities, as well as gestures, glances, body positions, and clothes. A discourse is a sort of identity kit which comes complete with the appropriate costume and instructions on how to act, talk, and often write so as to take on a particular role that others will recognize. So. Let's use baseball as our example. Let's say that you were completely unfamiliar with baseball, but you had decided that you wanted to go out for one of UC's intramural uh, club uh, baseball teams. So in order to, um, you would find that when you tried out for the team and began attending practices, that baseball players have a particular way of being that's kind of foreign to you as an outsider. Um, obviously they're wearing uniforms, so there's kind of our appropriate costume but they also think and talk and act in certain ways. Um, a baseball player can kind of read a field in a certain way, right? Um, a really good batter knows how to read a pitch based on um, what they observe in the pitcher and how he's throwing the ball. Um, they know how to read the outfield um, and the infield to kind of get, gauge where to hit the ball. Um, they have different ways of acting they have certain values and attitudes. There's definitely um, a pattern of language that's happening there that's very particular to baseball as well. Um, if you ever watch a baseball game, you'll hear um, particular terminology that means something there that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing elsewhere. So you hear that um, Chase Utley, for instance, likes to crowd the plate when he's at bat. Um, that's a very kind of particular, you know, you can kind of get a sense for that as an outsider, but maybe that means something uh, if you know baseball, you know that that means that that's one reason why he gets hit by so many pitches every year because he likes to stand very close to the plate um, and is therefore um, pretty easy to hit with a ball when the pitcher's trying to hit the strike zone. Um, so there are levels of knowledge created based on these ways of being in the world. So understanding them is to better understand that community and their ways. So in conclusion, the literacies and discourses in our everyday lives um, tend to reveal our values, backgrounds, and really our identities, the reason I have the thumbprint here. Um, so the social and cultural forces in your lives have tended to shape the ways in which you think and talk and act. And that's the basic idea behind this lecture and the basic idea I want you to take moving forward.